little girl runs for her life, for freedom. She escapes a temple house where girls are enslaved, forced to live lives of immorality. It is a cruel practice that has since been outlawed, but at the turn of the 20th century, no one knows its horrors more than seven-year-old Prina. As Prina runs, she remembers previous attempts, her capture, and the awful tortures. This time, Prina will not be caught. Her escape is one of the first successful ones in South India. The little girl begs a village woman to take her to an Irish Christian missionary. Her name is Amy Carmichael. I was sitting in the veranda. When she saw me, she ran straight up to me. My name is Prina, the child began, and I want to stay here always. I have come to stay. In her native tongue of Tamil, Prina calls Amy Carmichael Amma, the Tamil word for mother. Amy, Amma, Prina will be her first child. Amma will be her name forever. Over the next 50 years, Amy will be Amma to thousands of Indian children. Even today, more than 50 years after her death, Amma's children remember. She was a mother of every nation. She was a good mother. She was very soft with us. Very, very kind, gentle with the old, older ones and younger ones. She loves everybody. Very loving and kind and mother as a mother. Amma's children and the following generations live on roughly 170 acres, 30 miles from the southernmost tip of India. It is called the Donavur Fellowship. Donavur Fellowship is very much a family built up of girls and boys that were brought or saved from moral danger, from being given to temples, those who have lost parents and left destitutes. It is a sanctuary and an oasis. From the sandy red clay, plants and trees flourish. Their limbs often filled with children, the air filled with laughter and play. When this fellowship was being shaped, an old man asked me, we have heard much preaching can you show us the life of your Lord Jesus? At Donavur, the sick are treated. Babies nurtured. The elderly cared for. It is a remarkable enclave of living Christianity, primarily run by women. So miraculous, it begs the question, how did all this come to be? We have been asked to tell of the beginning of our fellowship, why it shaped as it did, and how it came to be a little thing committed to the hand of God. If only I can tell it under direction, it will carry at least one quality of clear running water, sincerity. It is often called the Emerald Isle, and it's not hard to see why. This is Ireland, an ancient land. A place of rolling green hills and charming characters. In December of 1867, it was the birthplace of Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael grew up in Northern Ireland uh, in a Protestant family. Her father and her grandfather owned the largest flour mill in that area. And it was a little place called Mill Isle. And so uh, she grew up there. She loved riding her horse along the sands of the North Sea. In my day, Mill Isle was a little old world village of whitewashed cottages on the shore of the Irish Sea. When I think back, the solemn sound like the rise and fall of the waves on the shore, of my father's reading at family worship, the sweet, sweet sound of my mother singing to her children, and the merry sound of laughter and play. She was the oldest of uh, seven children. She was just a little girl, and she stuffed her two little brothers through the skylight 
and then climbed through the skylight herself. And here they were sitting on this steeply slanted slate roof when they looked down and there were their astonished parents looking up at them. Uh, she was a girl that, that was very uninhibited and that to me just spoke volumes about her courage. She was a courageous little girl, but it was as a teenager that her life would be forever changed. It was a dull Sunday morning in a street in Belfast. I was returning from church when I met a poor, pathetic old woman who was carrying a heavy bundle. I had never seen such a thing in Presbyterian Belfast on Sunday, and moved by sudden pity, I turned with her, relieved her of the bundle, took her by her arms as though they had been handles, and helped her along. This meant facing all the respectable people who were on their way home. I hated doing it. Crimson all over, I plodded on, a wet wind blowing us about, and blowing too the rags of that poor old woman. But just as we passed a fountain, this mighty phrase was suddenly flashed, as it were, through the grey drizzle. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, if any man's work abide. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, the blinding flash had come and gone. I said nothing to anyone, but I knew that something had happened that had changed life's values. Nothing could ever matter again but the things that were eternal. Amy was transformed. She dedicated the rest of her life to serving others. Her service began with the women who labored in the Irish mills, in the Victorian era, they were called shawlies. It was a demeaning term for women who wore shawls to church because they could not afford more expensive hats. These mill-working women were led to believe church was better suited for ladies with hats. She never doubted the Lord and what he had done for her, but it came alive for her in this new place, began wanting to share what she was now experiencing with other people. And she was drawn to the, the factory girls. Amy saw them not as shawlies, but as children of God. As a teenager, she began leading Sunday school classes in a makeshift church she called The Welcome. The work for the mill girls grew till we needed a hall that would seat 500. Just then we saw an advertisement. An iron hall could be put up for 500 pounds. We decided to pray for 500 pounds and it was given an answer to prayer. During the dedication service of the hall, which we called The Welcome, I sat in the middle of the hall among the people and read over and over again the words printed by hand in large letters and hung in a long strip just above the low platform, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Truly, as truly as I knew how, I wanted those words to be fulfilled. Today, Amy's Welcome continues to be an important church and ministry in Belfast. After successfully organizing the Welcome, Amy felt called to missions. The longing to go to them and tell them of Jesus has been strong upon me. Everything seemed to be saying, go, come over and help us. Amy's call would take her far from Ireland. She would leave all she had known. The green, the sea, the countryside. And with the greatest difficulty, her family. It would not be easy. At 18, Amy's father died. Her widowed mother was left to raise seven children. I seem to be torn in two and just feel one big ache all over, yet the certainty is there. He said to me, go. 
It seems to me that all he asks is that we should take the one step he shows us and in simplest, most practical trust, leave all results for him. The time came when she felt very strongly that God was calling her to be a missionary. And she thought at first that she was go going to go to China and she ended up going to Japan. In Japan, Amy often preached to skeptics. Once an elderly woman showed interest until she noticed Amy's English gloves. She was old and ill and easily distracted. I cannot remember whether or not we were able to recall her to what mattered so much more than gloves. But I do remember I went home, took off my English clothes, put on my Japanese kimono, and never again, I trust, risked so very much for the sake of so very little. For the rest of her life, Amy wore the clothes and followed the customs of the countries where she served. But her time in a kimono would be short-lived. That only lasted about one year, and during that time she got what they called uh, Japan head, which was some sort of malady that seemed to strike many missionaries. And so she was sent back to England, then eventually went to India. India the land that Columbus coveted, that fascinated Kipling. A country of myth and mystery. It was certainly a foreign land for an Irish missionary. South India has not changed a great deal in the past 100 years. The natural beauty is awesome. Spectacular mountains tower over fields of rice and picturesque lakes. And yet, there is a tragic juxtaposition. This land, so naturally rich, is devastated by poverty. And so it was for Amy, only more so. She battled poverty, hunger, sickness, extreme heat, and the times in which she lived. Amy Carmichael was a woman living in the patriarchal Victorian era. A white woman preaching to a people under the tyranny of British rule about a religion virtually none of them practiced. It was always slow work because it was very, very difficult for people to change their religion, whether they were Hindus or Muslims. Amy and her fellow missionaries needed patience and tremendous faith. We were pelted with ashes and rotten garlands. One day a great cry drew round us and shouted its sentiments and made a most unholy racket. In theory I like this very much, but in practice not at all. We stood under a burning sun till we were too tired to stand any longer. Then we knelt down in the middle of the rubble and prayed. Amy had originally come to India to evangelize, but God had a different plan for her. While she was there, she heard of a custom which meant that little girl babies could be dedicated to temples where they were brought up and trained in Indian music and dancing. And later, these children became cult prostitutes. And Omar felt that as she had discovered this situation, that God had called her to rescue as many children as possible from that kind of danger. Prina's arrival was a benchmark. Amy became a ma and brought up the girl. But her struggles did not end. In many ways, as a ma, they had just begun. Our first baby was brought to us straight from the hands of a temple woman. Soon afterwards, two more came. Within a year, all three babies died. To the world in general looking on, we appeared to be failing badly. Where were our hopes, dead with the dead babies? withering with the withering children. We would not give up. Through much prayer and great faith, she was enabled to do that. And gradually, the children were saved and she brought them up and made a home for them and taught them of the Lord. And above all, she wanted that they should be witnesses to him as they grew up. Children tie the mother's feet, the Tamils say, so we let our feet be tied for love of him whose feet were pierced. Amma's ministry grew. 
The days of constant travel, living in tents and mud huts, eventually ended. Amma settled on a plot of land on which to build what would become the Donavour Fellowship. This special place had been chosen for our home. It is several miles from the road, and in those days, it was even more inaccessible than it is now. So it was not only safer for the children than a town would have been, it was good for us too, for we were free to serve without too many interruptions. It was beautiful because of the mountains to the west of the village. These mountains were a wonderful help. They were so unchangeably strong and tranquil and serene that just to look at them strengthened us.